We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Up, bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. It is another episode of AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. It is Thursday. We are here. We are talking about wrestling. And it is also Halloween. Happy Halloween. Uh, Will, do you do things with your kiddos or they have they grown out of it? Oh, yeah. No. Oh, no. I, I don't even want them to grow out of it. Are you kidding me? Uh, so they're 13 and 10. So it's very much our neighborhood's in the circle so we have to like go around the inner circle uh-huh, mm. first uh. and then we do the outer circle <laughs> and uh we usually end up with loads and loads of candy and it usually lasts till christmas so nice. yeah we are very much the halloween family i uh, i'm big on like big stupid costumes that's like my thing uh as a matter of fact uh if anybody has been watching the video edition of this show for any extended amount of time, you may have noticed there's a big panda mask over here. That was definitely from Halloween 2019, uh, where I was a big old panda. Uh, This year, I have to be a frog because my daughter wants to do this princess and a frog thing. So I have to dress in a giant frog costume. So that's respect. That's me. Respect. I'm not dressing up uh, on Halloween tonight because I dressed up yesterday. That's the thing I love about like being an adult is I just assumed as a kid that like, I would not have fun by the time I started like working, and now it's like nope. But it's funny because like it's it's one of those things you show up in a costume and you're like okay I got to dress, but like you're only in the costume for so long because you then have to change into your actual work uniform. Yes. I don't know how many people know this, but there's actually two shirts that we wear as a referee. The AEW shirt and the ROH shirt are both completely different. It's not just a patch you change. It's a, it's a deal <laughs> based on when your matches are and when you're changing and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's my nice segue into talking about Ring of Honor. So uh Will, who is our guest today? Aubrey, we are joined by a man who is synonymous with the Ring of Honor brand. He is he has been the voice of Ring of Honor as long as you've been watching Ring of Honor. Yes. He is the one and only Bobby Cruz. Bobby, thank you for being a part of AEW Unrestricted. Hi guys, thanks for having me. Great to be here. I'm so stoked. I'm so stoked for this. I literally had someone tweet at me like, "Hey, why haven't you had Bobby Cruz on the podcast?" I'm like, that is a solid question. Why have we not had Bobby Cruz on the podcast? Hey, Stacey, please get Bobby Cruz. And then boom, here we are. So it's like freaking Christmas. <laughs> I, I had a feeling that was why. Like I saw that tweet and then all of a sudden I see on our guest list, Bobby Cruz. And yep. I'm like, okay, these had to go hand in hand. But, you know, Bobby, you know, this is uh, it's almost like a full circle moment, right? Because like uh, going back to other podcast days, you and I have worked together before. And so to for this to now... Uh, for to be here is it, kind of cool, and it's like uh, it's almost like the exact same setting. Like I'm seeing you sitting here, and I'm like, oh yeah, this reminds me of yeah. Beyond the Bells back in the day. It's uh, like this is it, it's just except this time I'm not the boss. Yeah, that was the thing was I was working for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I did not know this. This is fun. Yeah, so it's it's fun, and uh, it it was great to get you into the AEW realm and to get you into the AEW family. It felt like it was a long time coming and now we get to see you on a regular basis. Yeah, it has been, it has been a long time coming and uh, probably longer than some people may realize uh, maybe stories that will never be told, but I was <laughs> when AEW started, of course I was under contract to ring of honor. And then you fast forward and just uh, look at the work I've been able to do with you guys in AEW and ring of honor and seeing so many old friends from the Ring of Honor days and or meeting new people that I really have a ton of respect for and the awesome crew that we have. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those full circle things, I guess. And it's uh, it's been a blast. I'm having the time of my life as far as my ring announcing career goes right now. Love it. I mean, Will kind of opened it up saying that like a voice that's synonymous with Ring of Honor. I can't hear Ring of Honor without thinking of you. And that's fantastic. And I remember when uh, ROH was being purchased by Tony Khan and you start running through all the things in your head of like, ooh, I wonder if this is going to happen. I wonder if this is going to happen. And one of the things on my list was, we got to bring Bobby Cruz, right? Like he's like the guy. So I'm just so happy that it it happened. And now I get a chance to like work with you and whatnot. No, I'm thrilled about it too. And I, I have a, a quick funny story about that actually is, so, you know, we find out TK buys Ring of Honor, um, Super Card of Honor that year, 2022, had already been announced by the previous ownership. I was not thrilled, I guess, um, 
with the way some of the things were handled, especially with my kind of role in management of with the women's division in 2021. I would have liked to have been a little bit more in the know as to what was going on, but I found out found out in that late October call just like everyone else did and not much heads up. And I was really concerned about friends of mine, obviously. Come to find out, you know, TK announces he's buying it. And I think it was a few days later, I got a text by uh, Hunter Johnston at that time was working as the middleman kind of between TK taking over Ring of Honor. And of course, he was the executive producer for the previous regime and said, you want to work Supercard? I said, yes, of course. He said, okay, let me confirm it, whatever. So somebody from AEW had reached out about asking about me. The next week uh, after Supercard was my first appearance on AEW. It was FTR versus the Young Bucks, yeah, which was a match that included the ROH World Tag Team titles. And it was in Boston, which is awesome. My daughters are there. And now here I am wondering what was happening with my announcing career and going from doing a Supercard of Honor for Tony Khan, who I wanted to work for Tony since he started, to now I'm on Dynamite. I mean, it was like a whirlwind for me. And um, a former Ring of Honor talent, I don't know if he wants this known, uh, who is with AEW, had brought up the idea of me do, being their personal ring announcer kind of thing because they wanted to be like doing an ROH thing. Kind of like the stuff I used to do with Steve Carino back in 2003, 2004. Yeah. Without the language, obviously. So I said, <laughs> yeah. I said, you know, and, and so it, it ran it by a couple of people. And somebody came to me and said, yeah, I think it's a great idea, but Bobby, you're really expensive. I remember thinking to myself, I never really discussed any sort of financial thing. I did Supercard with the, you know, the amount that was asked. And I said, oh, yeah, of course. I was very happy with that. Very generous. And so I was like, what do you mean? So it had come about, talk about full circle. When the previous owners of Ring of Honor were going to run Supercard that year, I gave them a ridiculous price. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. People can say I'm like Mr. Ring of Honor ring announcer, but the way things went down and the way things had continued to go down for the, for the first couple months of that year, again, being really concerned with my friends who had bought some new houses and so just, I wasn't happy with the way they handled it basically. So I gave them a ridiculous price. Well, AEW, the people at AEW that I was dealing with thought that was my price, my per night price. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. Oh, no. So I had to, that night in Boston, thankfully, face-to-face, clear it up and, and say, okay, I'll explain that, you know, up the chain kind of thing. I said, no, no, no. That was the price for the old ownership. Now, this is completely different for what I'll work for here now. So that was kind of funny, but it was almost scary because if they wouldn't have asked me, you know, maybe they wouldn't have continued to use me just thinking I had this ridiculous price in mind. Yeah, so just to keep Will in the know, because I know he's he knows people on the inside. In in wrestling, there's typically like your regular rate, <laughs> your brother rate, and then your FU rate. That was the FU rate. The FU rate right. went to uh, that, that management. It's the people you don't want to work for, but if the number's ridiculous enough and they meet it, then you're willing to kind of like do the show. So um, yeah, no, there's yeah. there's diff- different rates for different people. <laughs> yes. Peeling back yes. the curtain on that one quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That was the FU rate. All right, so I, I want to talk about the the history with Ring of Honor because as somebody who I didn't get into Ring of Honor till about two thousand four, but by that point, Bobby Cruz is well established as voice of Ring of Honor. How did that come about for you? How did what was the original conversation like for you? You started with Ring of Honor in oh three. Technically, yes, Steve Carino, who I mentioned before, I had been doing. I had met Steve a couple years before, around two thousand one. I was booking a company up here in Massachusetts, and uh, we would run some events where we'd bring in a quote-unquote name or two, right, a headline, some of these, some bot shows, telemarketed shows, and uh, ECW was just kind of going away at that point, so I reached out to Steve, and first time we met, and as he says, we hit kind of hit it off. He was running his own company, the PWF, which ended up becoming World One in conjunction with Zero One, who is constantly, he was in Japan constantly with Zero One back then. Uh, once a month on a Sunday night in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which, listen, I love seeing fans and I love going. Play. I hope I never have to go back to Pottstown, Pennsylvania again, <laughs> at least from here. It's just a torturous drive, boring, long. It's way out there in Pennsylvania. It's always a Sunday night. And I'm working the show and then I come back and drive overnight and go to the day job. And I'm like, this is just, but it all worked out. It was great. So one day I get a and the old AOL IM, you remember that one? Oh, brother. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, AIM, I was a big AIM guy. <laughs> I get a what do call it? instant message from Carino. 
uh, saying, hey, I had this idea. I'm going to go back to Ring of Honor. I want to have my own personal ring announcer, and I want you to do it. And he ran the idea past me, and I said yes very quickly. Well, yeah. It was one of the coolest things I ever heard for a ring announcer, the chance to get out there and just really announce one person. But being a hole about it to me, I thought it was just something. <laughs> it was just something I'd never done before, and uh, I thought it'd be a really cool thing. So we did that several times. Um, always got reactions that we were looking for, except the, the last one or two started to get some cheers instead of the uh, Ring of Honor fans telling me to shut the f up. So we said, "Oh, this is maybe kind of run its course." And there was a uh, a show, two shows, Dayton, Ohio, and Chicago weekend where we were going to do the Carino intros and Carino actually got pulled from those ring of honor events to go to Japan to zero one. And Gabe Sapolsky who was the booker at the time. said, well, you're already coming. Why don't you just be the ring announcer for the shows? Just do the, just, and I said, you really want me to do it straight. Like I do as a ring announcer. He says, yeah, let's do it. So I did those two events. And then there was another one in um, Lexington mass near Boston up here where they had asked me to do that one. And that was in May, I think of 2004. And I think there was much else they had asked about maybe me doing the being the East Coast guy. And then I think it was October or November of 04, Carrie Silken, the longtime former owner of Ring of Honor, called me and he, he said, hey, if uh, the ring announcing spot becomes available, would you take it? We want you to be our ring announcer no matter where we go, Chicago, Boston, New York, Tokyo, whatever. We want you to be our ring announcer. So I knew they had a ring announcer at the time. My answer was, if it becomes available, I'll take it. And he said, okay, give me an hour. And it was about, about a half hour later, he called me back. He said, okay, it's available. <laughs> so What? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how that went down. Oh, my God. <laughs> the ring announcer they had been using was not very happy with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. It's not like it's your fault. What I do? Yeah, I mean, like. <laughs> I said, you were just be, available. Yeah, I said, if you, if you want me to say no, I won't take it. You know, Ring of Honor was the cool thing at the time, and it was really going to get me out there traveling more. And yeah, so I, I took it, and that was uh, November of two thousand four. It was Weekend of Thunder with Jushin Liger. Yeah, I yep, remember yep. the first night. Actually, the first night was actually in Boston, which is great. So my really my first night as the lead ring announcer for Ring of Honor was in Boston. And it was headlined by Jushin Liger and Brian Danielson. Oh, so not a bad way to get going. That's a fantastic way. Just, you know, no big deal. Just two legends, whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> they, they, they were okay. Oh, my God. So you've you've gotten to work with tons and tons of talent that have come through Ring of Honor that have become international stars. Brian Danielson, Samoa Joe, Nigel McGuinness. Like, the, the list goes on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Are there any moments that you can look back at and go, these guys are going to be the guys. You know, it's, it's funny because Ring of Honor, back when we really started cranking, was kind of put in a bubble. You know, no one else is going to want these guys. You know, th these other places, not, there were, there, not that there were many places to go. You know, that's why Ring of Honor was a needed alternative back then. You, you saw the star power. You saw the natural charisma a guy like Samoa Joe had. I mean, it just oozed it as soon as you saw him. Never mind the stuff he did in the ring. He just had a natural presence about him and so forth. And then it was really cool to reconnect with a guy like Nigel all these years later. I saw him when he first came in, uh, had moved from the UK, uh, was training with Les Thatcher back then down in uh, the Ohio area, just to see him evolve. I saw him evolve from – a guy just trying to get a spot to a mid card guy to main eventing in Liverpool against Danielson in the unification bout. So I, I've had, I have seen it over the years and it's amazing. Like someone like Joe or someone like Nigel, or the Briscoes, or I'm going to leave out people, even Adam Cole, you know, came in a little bit later and during our HD net days, you could see, I mean, young kid, you could just see something was going to happen. Usually it does. What a great conversation. And there's so much more I want to talk about as far as the, the history of Ring of Honor and, and some of the things you've gotten to see. And we are going to talk about all of that right here when AEW Unrestricted continues. AEW Unrestricted. It's Aubrey and Will with our guest, Bobby Cruz. Yes. You know, we were just talking a little bit about some of the names you've gotten to see come through Ring of Honor. And and what's interesting is not just the names, but the eras of Ring of Honor, right? Because, like, when you think about um, those early years and you've got the HDNet years, you've got those uh, the, the Jim Cornette era. There's so many different time periods that Ring of Honor uh, went through. And 
you have to experience it all. Mm -hmm. uh, what were some of those regime changes like and having to essentially kind of hold on and kind of grit your teeth as things are <laughs> kind of getting rocky and changing? It was interesting. I came into Ring of Honor basically the same year that Carrie Silken became the sole owner of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why he made the call that he made about wanted me to be the ring announcer. I've always said that Steve Carino and, and Carrie were really the two that helped my career the most because they, Steve got me out of New England and Carrie made the call for me to, uh, to be in Ring of Honor. And here we are 20 years later and it's been a ride. So, but it's, uh, there's a couple of times it's been a little scary because I remember the HDNet thing was big for us. Uh, it was owned by Mark Cuban at the time. And we had never done TV. We were, you know, DVD underground company and done a couple taped pay-per-views. Trading Ring of Honor DVDs was a oh, time, buddy. by the way. That was a... <laughs> hey, I have... I, it's crazy. I was going through a spare room. I had so many. I, they used to... If you appeared on an event, they gave you the DVD when it came out. So I have like hundreds and packages that because now I just look at Honor Club, right? But the DVDs back then was the only way. And it's like I was on every show. So I have all these DVDs. So. As, a, as a podcaster, I used to do giveaways of Ring of Honor DVDs back in like 2005, 2006, uh, because it's like, if you want to see Joe and Kobashi, this is how oh, you yeah. watch that match. Yeah. That's how it went. So it's it's great to, to think back that like, it's hard to explain to, to young people today that that's how you had to get them. That's how you're going to see those matches. <laughs> that's it. You couldn't just go and watch something on streaming. What was streaming? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But getting back to your question, I remember when Gabe Sapolsky was let go. Uh, we had a show at, in Edison, New Jersey. I was driving back from a Saturday night, and Carrie called me, and he told me that he let Gabe go. And I thought, I thought the world would be falling then because Gabe was Ring of Honor. You know, Gabe was there from day one of creating Ring of Honor, and it was such a – he came up with some stuff that, in my booking mind, I could never even dream of. So just some really awesome stuff. So I always thought, like, Gabe, if there's a Ring of Honor, Gabe will be the booker which is in real life. Everything ends and there's burnout and there's uh, just tenure and everything. So uh, Adam Pierce was made the booker, which at the time he was wrestling still and kind of caught me off guard. Uh, Carrie and I talked all the time, but I, I was kind of blindsided with the thought of Pierce. Pierce was a funny one because when Gabe brought him in to be a wrestler, I think his first night with us was in Long Island and he had gotten my, I think it was email from, uh, from Gabe and he dropped me an email, which I'd never expected. I'd never met Adam before or anything. And he, he's literally said, I've watched you over the years. I always wanted to be in ring of honor to get to ring of honor and have you introduce me. I think you're awesome. And this and that. And we kind of just bonded from there. When I started to get to know him, I thought he was a complete jerk. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> and then we started talking. And then when he took over to this day, he would say that I was his right hand man. I was, person he would bounce booking stuff off of, but I was also booking all the extras back then. There were the, some people that are in AW now, like Adam Cole, that literally came, uh, their first times were coming to uh, Ring of Honor at the 2300 Arena uh, when we taped HDNet, when Pierce was the booker and I was booking dark matches and stuff like that. So then when Pierce got let go, it was uh, like, okay, now what are we going to do? And again, I didn't see this coming, but Delirious gets made the booker. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Carrie tells me, you know, I'm going to make Hunter the booker. I'm like, okay. And, you know, that's kind of when Cornette came back in as well. Cornette had been in TNA and his time kind of ended. And uh, I was no longer doing any of the behind the scenes stuff I had been doing. I just went back to doing ring announcing stuff. Just to fast forward, when Sinclair Broadcast Group bought it, there were all sorts of rumors of who was buying the company. Like, it was wasn't um, a secret that Carrie had pretty much stretched himself as far as he could financially keeping the company alive. He did that several times. So we, we were in Chicago Ridge at one of our go-to arenas, the Frontier Fieldhouse in Chicago Ridge. And we were told we we're going to have a pre-show meeting. And a few people from the Sinclair Broadcast Group came in and said they bought the company and they were going to make it a weekly TV show on their, all their affiliates, kind of old school style kind of like a syndication thing. And that's how we were until TK comes and saves the day. It's absolutely wild. As, as a shout out to, to Carrie, like wrestling is very expensive to put on. No. I even see like my buddies locally who are running 
indie shows. And like, if you're able to break even, you are extremely successful. I don't think people understand like the just amount of money that goes into talent, lighting, production, the ring, travel, everything. So I think that's the thing that I appreciate about Ring of Honor so much is it's like, it's always been this sort of like small underground gritty thing that survived for so mm -hmm. long and as a result created so many stars and so much history and so many memorable moments that we like we still reference to to this day <laughs> yeah that's just to your point that's we've talked about it's created help create many stars right i believe stars stars create stars stars create themselves but they need the exposure. They need the opportunities to go and learn and stuff. But that they have it, they're going to have it eventually. Correct. Uh, you hit the perfect uh, word right there. It's like memorable moments. Everyone knows about the stars. If you took a step back and just looked at memorable moments in Ring of Honor history, it's absolutely wild. Like I've been asked in the past, so what's your favorite moment or your favorite few moments? And it's so difficult because like, Will, you were talking about earlier, you don't want to stop mentioning names of people who are in AEW or whatever that were in Ring of Honor because you're always going to leave people out. And that's, it's impossible not to. So I do that all the time. You know, and I, of course, I bring up Joe versus Kobashi because that atmosphere was unbelievable. And being standing in the middle of the ring in Liverpool in front of a sold out crowd for Nigel and Brian, where the fans knew they were going to see something awesome because it's Nigel and Brian. It's Nigel's home country, of course. And they also knew that they were going to basically see history because the pure title and the world title were going to be unified that night. There's just so much stuff. I mean, Jay Briscoe winning the world title and Jay, Jay versus Jay, Lethal versus Briscoe in New York City, title for title. Just, there's just so much stuff. It's just, it just piles up. So what was it like doing um, Supercard of Honor at Madison Square Garden? That's a dream <laughs> venue for me. <laughs> MSG ended up being something that was a wake-up call for me. And what I mean by that is I, I don't think I not enjoyed it as much. I, I don't think that I took it all in as much as I should have because it was kind of chaos. <laughs> you don't say. We're there, we're there early in the day. Uh, we're doing some stuff we had really never done before production-wise. We had obviously New Japan was co-running the event with us. So a New Japan ring announcer was there that I was working with. We'd have a separate meeting with just myself, their ring announcer, the translator, about how we were going to do things. And next thing you know, it's ready, pretty much ready to go. And I, was, I wish I took it in more when it was able to. So ever since then, I have. Like even when, uh, say a couple of years ago, when there'd be a Ring of Honor world title match on Dynamite somewhere, and I would just be coming in and doing that one match. Like I would take everything in. And that's what I do. Every time I'm in an arena or I go back somewhere or just I try and soak everything in because it's it's not going to last forever. I'm so appreciative of the opportunity that I get to still keep going doing this. And really, other than MSG, this is, you know, this is the biggest stage a Ring of Honor's ever been on running events at AEW or announced Madison Square Garden in the past couple of years, the Kia Forum in Wembley Stadium. Wild. Right there. I could be done. OK, I'm done. That's it. <laughs> you know? Um, stuff I never thought I would do. But MSG, of course, was special because it's MSG. And I was a huge Howard Finkel guy. Watching Howard has made me want to become a ring announcer. And so that was really special to be able to stand in the arena that he dominated as a ring announcer for so long. I, I do have to say, though, as, as a Boston native, did a piece of you die just a little bit just being in <laughs> Madison Square Garden and just thinking like, well, good question. I never, well, no, not at all. Not at all. I, and I, uh, it's funny. I never thought I would do Madison Square Garden. So that was awesome. Now, the past couple of years with AEW, being able to do TD Garden. I was going to say, you've got to do TD Garden. Mm. Yeah, there was, um, I think at the first time, right? 2023 was the first TD Garden. That was Blood and Guts. Yeah, I think that's, that's the one where I didn't have anything. We weren't doing Ring of Honor or anything that night. But, you know, that's the arena that I've gone to hockey games with my daughters and so forth. And that's our team where our teams play. So I text Mike Mansuri a couple of days before and I said, hey, do you think I could just do a dark match? You know, just be, so I can say I announced the TD Guard to be really special. Ended up doing the dark match that night, which was cool. We got something coming up here that I pray we do some ROH for in Providence. Mm. Providence is my building. As much as TD Guard meant to, meant to me. Providence would mean even more. 
that it's the old Providence Civic Center. Then it became the Dunkin' Donuts Center. Now it's the AMP, the Amica Mutual Pavilion. On uh, November seventh. That that that's November seventh. November seventh. It's a Thursday collision taping. So I'm hoping we get some ROH that night too, because I. It's 30 minutes from my house. Oh, but- look at that. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't hurt. But, doesn't hurt. You no, know, but that building specifically, that's where I used to go as a young teenager every month to go see house shows and so forth. That building really, my grandfather used to take me. So it really has a lot of sentimental value. I've always just said, I just want to, that's another one. Just give me one match in that building and I'll be thrilled. So hopefully November 7th, Providence, let's do it. Hell yeah. Oh, my God. Well, we've got a lot more to get to. Uh, We're going to hit you back at this third portion of the show right here when AEW Unrestricted continues. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey and Will having an awesome conversation with ring announcer extraordinaire Bobby Cruz, uh, who, if you're watching the YouTube edition, we've seen three different versions of Bobby now (laughs) as the (laughs) light has changed position multiple times in his house. I love it. The reality of uh, broadcasting. (laughs) Twilight in uh, New England in the fall. This is what we deal with. There we go. It's awesome. Making it it special. Anyway, uh, speaking of special, kind of hard to not talk about ROH and AEW without eventually talking about All In and how special it was in 2018 in Chicago. At the time, it was the Sears Center. How did you get involved in the history-making show? It was funny. I I was getting asked it quickly became in vogue to be all in. Are you all in? Are you all in? I was very jealous. <laughs> yes. The Buck, you know, we had Ring of Honor events and the Bucks would ask me, Bob, you all in? And I'm like, I don't know. You guys are going to tell me. Like, am I all in? But <laughs> it's your so, show. <laughs> right, yeah. So finally we had a show in New York City. Somebody told me, like, Bob, you're all in. I said, okay. Which is great because I knew it was going to be really cool. And I remember being in Chicago. We had a show, Ring of Honor show in Chicago, the day tickets went on sale. I want to say it was like three or four o'clock in the afternoon and they sold out in less than 30 minutes. And I saw the elite and I saw the management of Sinclair Broadcast Group that was on site that night and just kind of high-fiving each other because uh, the, the thing had sold out so quickly. So, And then we were in England on a Ring of Honor loop, standing outside the hotel waiting for the bus. I don't know why I remember these little details. But Those are the fun ones. It's great. This makes for a great podcast. There we go. <laughs> yeah. I was approached about, hey, what do you think about Justin doing the show with you? So Because I, I know there was concern about they didn't want it to just look like an ROH show with some other people thrown in. You know what I mean? Like, yes, there, were, there was talent that had never appeared in ROH that was going to be used on All In, but they wanted it to have a, a completely different look. And sound, uh, you know, Ian's on commentary, obviously. I'm ring announcing. The ref, Paul was refereeing as well. But there was also a mixture of outside talent. And that's the way they wanted it to be. Kind of like an all-star show is the way it was explained to me. It's almost like a forbidden door was opened or something. Yeah, yeah. And I said, <laughs> good one. So I said to, I said, yeah. I said, Justin, that's great. Let's, let's, I'd never worked with Justin. We had talked over the years, but we'd never worked together. So I thought it'd be really cool. And uh, it was. It was a uh, great to kind of sit back and uh, you know and take some stuff in as if it was his turn you know we pretty much just swapped every other match to make it simple i remember uh delirious is actually he's the one that formatted the show the week before we were in philly and he sent me he showed me the format to kind of look over and kind of see if i saw anything that stuck out one of the first things it says you know coming on the air was justin was introducing the person singing the national anthem he said you know why Justin's doing it. And I said, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> like, I'm not even thinking about it because I did the match assignments as far as what Justin did, what I did. But the national anthem thing, I didn't even think of or whatever. It's, well, it's just, we don't want to come up on the air and the first thing that people see and hear is you and they think ROH. Mm. You don't have to explain that, but it makes perfect sense. So let's do it. And it's not anything against you, but I can almost understand that at the time, I remember that show needed to feel as not ROH as possible, (laughs) that it needed to feel like its own thing. And because for a lot of people, it was. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because at the end of the day, when you think about production and who was like footing a lot of the bill for a lot of that stuff, it was Ring of Honor. Right. But it needed to not look like Ring of Honor. And so like, I I understand that uh, to an extent. But then also it's like, but it's Bobby Cruz. And like, (laughs) there's a uniqueness to what Bobby Cruz offers. And the fact that this was reaching beyond what Ring of Honor ever offered uh, or ever even reached, I mean, it's another way to say, like, you're introducing this new voice to people. So, hey, I, there's two minds about it. 
Yeah, I remember that actually Justin that night. He was because he was going to be literally the first ring announcer, the first person in the ring, uh-huh. and he was a little concerned that he's like fans how they would react to him because uh, he hadn't been doing wrestling for a few years at that point. That they forget him, but and I said, Justin, you're announced on television for whatever a dozen years. You're from Chicago. This show is in Chicago. Yes. There's going to be no issue. You're going to be pre- – and he got in the ring before we came up on the air as they were waiting to come up live, and a bunch of fans are chanting, Justin Roberts, Justin. And I, he kind of looked down at me at the table. I looked back at him, and I'm like, yeah, see, no worries. <laughs> no worries. Everybody gets in their own head about things. Oh, yeah. But co- coming out of that show, could you feel like, okay, this is about to be something that's probably going to change the wrestling world. This is going to be something that's going to continue for the rest of – the foreseeable future. Yeah, I know it. There was talk of, oh, we'll do it again next year. Basically, I'd heard that, right? It was so successful. Let's do it again next year. But I also, I, I was close with the Bucks. We talked a lot. We've always gotten along. It's always a mutually respectful uh, relationship we've had. You know, I had known their deal was coming up, and I'd known some other guys' deals were coming up, and things may have not been going so great on the negotiation side with Sinclair Broadcast Group. So, Never in my wildest dreams. It might have been a nightmare back then because I'm like, oh, everyone, they're leaving me behind. Now it's a dream, right? We're all in the same place, so it's great. Never in my wildest dreams that I think they would go on to help create a company just as massive and as awesome as AEW. And I don't just say that because I have a contract. I say that because it's true. I used to watch the stuff, especially during COVID, uh, because we would go tape down in Baltimore, Ring of Honor, like two or three days. And we'd be off for like two months. So I was like, I wasn't seeing any wrestling except when I would watch Dynamite and so forth. So, and just to see what old friends were up to and the product was so good and just different and exciting. I was really into it. And to see old friends doing well and and doing stuff, it was great. Yeah, I guess it would have been interesting to see if Sinclair Broadcast Group would have blown them away with an offer. I would have this still gone this way. Who knows? I'm glad it went the way it did. You know, TK has been so awesome, especially when it comes to the ROH side of even if it's just a sporadic one off for TV or a pay per view or something like TK knows Ring of Honor. TK like respects Ring of Honor. It's not just, yeah, let's put up an honor club. Like people can go watch Joe and Gapashi 50 times. No, it's like, you know, original content every week. And so we've done some really, really cool stuff with what we tape weekly for Ring of Honor. And I think every Ring of Honor title has been defended on. AEW programming, yeah. which is really cool too. It's not just, oh, it's just Ring of Honor and we're going to tape it here. We're going to tape it there and put it on our club and three times a year have a Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Is it just the women's TV title at this point that hasn't? Yeah, that's probably the only one. I think so, like, because it's new. Yeah. Thanks for correcting me, Will. Yes. because yeah, it's no, I'm <laughs> thinking about that. <laughs> that's, that's I'm what he does. Like going in my brain and I'm like, is that the only one that hasn't been defended? And I think As Red right. Velvet watches this and texts me. Yes. You know? <laughs> like, hey, Bobby. <laughs> but... No, yeah, that would obviously is the newest one, but that's uh, yeah, it's it's just been it's just been really. It sounds so corny. I say it all the time. I've had this conversation with Mike Mansuri multiple times, where I just feel so uh, blessed to still be doing this and doing it, and I think at a high level on AEW programming in front of the fans that we have, the crew. I mean, this crew is like awesome that I get to work with backstage and in the truck, and I really, really feel uh, blessed. Yeah. Uh, for people who don't know, we have about between 200 and 250 people, staff, crew, talent, every week at TV. So to be a part of that team, like it sounds like a lot of people, but it's actually really small. So to be a part of that group that does live television multiple times a week is pretty damn cool. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you're grateful for it. I'm grateful for it. I'm, I don't want to speak for Will, but I'm pretty certain he's grateful <laughs> for it as well. <laughs> Are you kidding me? He's grateful. <laughs> Pinching myself every week. <laughs> hey, before we go, I always like hearing Jay Briscoe stories from mm. people who worked with him so much in Ring of Honor. Do you have a Jay Briscoe story that stands out in your mind? I probably can't swear, right? So <laughs> You can. Within reason. I'm not going to. I, I said F, the, the letter. So I'll, I, Jay Briscoe. <laughs> I have a lot of Jay Briscoe stories, obviously, over 20 years, but what a what a treasure and what a – not only a talent, but just that, that whole family, just to be around them. It's, it's just awesome. Oh my God. There was a time where every event we had for Ring of Honor, we would pass each other in the halls or see each other by the ring in the afternoon or, or something, 
He was one of the few people that I ever allowed to call me Bob. I hate that name, Bob. I, I just don't like it. I'm a junior, so that was my father. I like Bobby, and I think it sounds more like show busy too, Bobby. Like, it does. People think does. my name's fake, which is because the way it's spelled, like Tom, Tom Cruise. My name but, is, so yeah. it's fine. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> so he would, we would see each other, and he would just, the first thing after maybe we'd have a quick hug, we'd part ways, I'd walk it away, Bob, don't F it up. And I said, okay. And it didn't matter, like, what match. We didn't even know. Ma- ma- it could have been <laughs> 10 matches on the card. So, like, don't F up any of them, basically. But then he'd have a world title match or something. We'd be doing, like, the old school in-ring intros. And he would come in, and he's doing his beauty shots and everything. And he would turn to me, Bob, don't F it up. Do the in-ring intros. He's have his match. We're done. I'd see him afterwards and give a high five or a hug. And he's like, Bob. You didn't F it up. Good job. <laughs> Same thing every time. It used to crack him up because sometimes I would really put it over and be like, man, will you stop? You know, enough. I'm not, it's going to get in my head. I'm going to F it up. That's just one of the small things. Just a really, really fun guy to be around. Man, we miss, we miss him so much. Mm-hmm. I think the world misses him and you could see his footprint pretty much or his fingerprints, I should say. Everywhere you, you look in AEW, Ring of Honor, wherever it is, it just feels like he touched everybody in some way, shape or form. And I just want to follow up with that real, real quick. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but just go back to TK again. The respect that he has for Ring of Honor, but Ring of Honor's history and the people in it. What happened with Jamin obviously is a tragic thing, but the way we have continued to honor him, you know, with the, the ladder match at Supercard, mm-hmm. you know, the Jay Briscoe reach for the sky match, his likeness on the title belts, on the side plates. And so that was I the mean, cool one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just really, really cool stuff that I think it takes someone special like TK and his passion for everything he does. But, you know, one of those things is now Ring of Honor to just, you know, little details that are really, really cool. That's the beauty of wrestling, right? Like the relationships you make with people and the connections that are fostered that I don't know of any other performance, physicality, live entertainment Mm -hmm. where something like this happens on a consistent basis. We're literally a traveling circus and we just get to see each other more than we see our own family. And it's so absolutely incredible. Right. Yep. And I'm fired back. I'm getting on the road. I'm hopping back on a collision for a week. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really excited. Arkady's got a personal engagement to attend to. So I'm really jacked up about uh, getting back out there with you guys. She was telling me how excited you were to fill in for her. So I love that Like, there's like camaraderie al- along the, uh, the announcers. Yeah, she's been great and so respectful. We had a heart-to-heart one day. She's like, you're not mad I'm going on collision. I'm like, no, I was just like the foster dad until you were ready to come, <laughs> come adopt. You know what I mean? I was just keeping the, you know, keeping the microphone and the seat warm until you're ready to go. But she's, she's doing great, and she's a, she's a really good person. I, I really enjoy working with her. So. Yeah, I can handle it for a night. I got it, Arx. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah. She she can take care of it. It's great. Well, this this whole conversation's been great. Thank you so much, Bobby, for, for stopping by the studio and moving your computer frequently throughout your house so that we could see your beautiful face. <laughs> really appreciate it. Follow Bobby on Twitter, uh, Real Bobby Cruz. And of course, you can listen and follow this podcast, AEW Unrestricted, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of the fun podcast apps. Check out video episodes of this podcast on our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button. They come out roughly on Mondays. Catch all of the latest AEW shows on the go when you download the TNT and TBS apps from the App Store and Google Play. Then sign up for a weekly newsletter at tntdrama.com slash Elite Fleet to get updates on the upcoming shows, live events, sweepstakes, merchandise, and more. Dynamite TBS Wednesdays. Rampage, TNT, Fridays, AW Collision, live, Saturdays, TNT. And of course, don't forget, ROH streams literally every Thursday on Honor Club. Listen to this beautiful, beautiful voice of Bobby Cruz there, as well as all of the history, like 20 plus year history of Ring of Honor on there. I am Aubrey Edwards with Will Washington. Thank you so much for listening to AEW Unrestricted. Come on, throw your hands up, let me see you. Unrestricted.